Reading from the book of James. Blessed is anyone who endures temptation. Such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places, and if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we're coming to the end of our journey on the yellow brick road of discipleship, if you like. Or are we coming to the end of that journey? So far, in the last few weeks, we started out on the journey. We, we began taking that step on the road and, and beginning to walk along it. Um, we came to a crossroads where we looked at the whole thing of making God-centered decisions and choices. Uh, we then faced some more difficult challenges and, and some more difficult issues, maybe testings and trials in our life and, and looking at how our faith can sustain us and enable us through such times. So today, what we're going to do just to finally wrap this up a little bit we're going to look at what keeps us going on this journey. The destination is in sight and it looks wonderful, it looks beautiful, um, but there are still challenges. There are still forces at work and there's that temptation to just give up and to rest and to sleep and just to leave the journey behind for a time, if you like. And for us, in our discipleship, in our walk, with God in our following of Jesus, sometimes we find that it is just too hard, it's too difficult, it's, it's too challenging. Sometimes we feel that it's, it's much easier just to maybe lie down and forget about it and, and put it behind us. You know, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if, if people have said things like this and particularly in relation to the rule of life stuff that the bishop encouraged us to embrace and to, to follow, you know. Um, praying, well, you know, I, I haven't got time to pray and I, and I can't be bothered praying. And then, you know, why, why read an, a book? Why read an old book that's 2,000 years old or whatever and, um, and, and doesn't make a lot of sense sometimes and I don't understand it. So, you know, I mean, let's just leave that to one side as well. And, and meeting together to learn with others in, in a different context, well... Ah, that's not my kind of thing. Um, and the other stuff, you know, tell others about this. Well, what's the point of that? You know, it's, I'm, I'm fine. This is okay. And, um, you know, serve others. Well, I come here and I, and I, and I get my communion and, then, and I go home and, and that's it, really. That's, that's all I really want out of it. And then the giving bit, well, give, well, you know, I might, I might give a little. And... When you think about it, quite often I'm sure there's been times when we felt like that or thought like that. But is that to you what a Christian disciple should be like and should look like? As you can appreciate from things we've said previously in this series, the early Christians, that wasn't their attitude and that wasn't their understanding of what their journey of faith was about. They, they fully embraced the aspects of the journey of faith, even during the things that they faced at those times. And those things that helped them to keep that focus, those things that helped them to keep going 
even when they were feeling maybe a bit sleepy and a bit tired and want to just lie down for a little bit, um, the things that kept them going were A, what Jesus meant to them, and B, where their ultimate destination lay. So just for a few moments, we're going to look at both of those. First of all, what Jesus meant to them. A couple of weeks ago, I was invited to go to, uh, to Bishop Paul's house uh, and, and to share together with a group of other clergy uh, looking at, and this was the second time, it was the second phase, if you like. We, we got together, a few of us, to look at what it meant to pray read and learn the the inward journey of the rule of life this time a couple of weeks ago we got together to look at the outward journey more the, the tell and the serve and the give and in particular we looked at the give aspect of it now one of the things that bishop paul felt was that that most people had got hung up when it came to the giving bit on just the financial aspect of it I mean, yes, he acknowledged it was important to get that right and important for us to get the right attitude towards giving in relation to finance and and those sort of things. But he was actually keener. Uh, He got to grips with the, uh, the aspect of giving being us as an oblation. An oblation. Now, in the dictionary, the word oblation is defined like this. A thing presented or offered to a God. A thing that is presented or offered to a God. So, for instance, for us in our Christian faith, we we believe that Jesus offered himself on the cross as an oblation to God on our behalf. That was what he was doing at that point in time. He made a sacrificial offering of himself. So in the context of the giving in the rule of life, we are to be ones who are constantly offering ourselves to God. We're the ones who are supposed to be giving sacrificially of ourselves, presenting ourselves as an oblation to God in that way we've just described. Because I guess if Jesus has done that for us, we should be asking ourselves, what can we give in return? If Jesus giving himself in that way for us means something to us, if it means something in here and not just in here, then we should be asking of ourselves, what do we give of ourselves? How do we offer ourselves and present ourselves to God in that way? So financial, yes, that comes with it. That's part of the package. But the oblation aspect of it as well was something that our bishop wanted us to grasp and to consider and to question ourselves about. Secondly, when sacrificial giving in that way of ourselves becomes tough, knowing our destination helps us to persevere. It's why Paul, as we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, when he talked about the things that he went through on behalf of his faith and on behalf of his calling in his faith to be a leader and and somebody who spoke to uh, the Gentile people outside of the Jewish uh, circles, if you like, and go and start churches in those places. It's why he went through floggings and stonings and imprisonments and being mistreated and shipwrecked and being hounded out of places by people left, right and centre. And he writes to the church in the Philippians where he says, the reason we do this is because of who Jesus is to us and because we press on towards the goal. We know that by doing this we're pressing on to the ultimate destination of our faith which we get in eternal life. How many people have ever read the classic book, many years old now, of course, by John Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress? Anybody read Pilgrim's Progress? Right, okay, fantastic book. Like I say, it's very old now, but uh, Christian in the book, he sort of, this chap makes a, a Christian decision. It's obviously a novel about his journey to the celestial city. And he faces on the way to the celestial city many obstacles such as the wicked gate 
and the slough of despond. Who's, I mean, without even reading the book, who's heard of the slough of despond? Okay, right, well, you know, there you go. That's something you learn every day, something to look up. Uh, things like Vanity Fair. You'll have heard of Vanity Fair, I'm sure. And the giant doubting castle. And many other things that Christian faces on his pilgrimage and on his journey to reach the celestial city. But that was his destination. And that's what kept him going all the way through. Uh, along with other people who came alongside him for a bit and came and supported him in different ways. It's a classic book that's worth reading about being a disciple and the things that happen on a journey to the less celestial city. But as James puts it in that letter we had read to us, the very first letter, sentence of that letter, where it says this, Blessed is anyone who endures temptation. Such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. The crown of life, the ultimate destination in heaven where we receive the blessings that Jesus has in store for us in that place. That's what the writers of many of these letters, one in, in Paul writes to Timothy in one of his letters, again, a similar thing about by continuing and pressing on, we receive the goal of eternal life. Now, the thing was, for those people, the journey itself was not an end in itself. It was the destination that kept them going. The journey was important and they walked that journey constantly despite everything they faced. But it was the goal that inspired them. You may have also, um, or not as the case may be, read the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis with, with Aslan the lion. Uh, and towards the end of the last book, uh, Aslan is bounding up towards the heavenly place and of course uses that well-known phrase, onward and upward. It was about the destination, the journey being important, but the destination being the key thing. Now, as you can appreciate, some people don't find this easy and that's always been the truth because again Jesus was talking in John chapter 6 to a crowd of people and he actually put before them some quite difficult and challenging teachings about faith in him and discipleship and many people who had been following him at that point in time he'd built up quite a big following of a fashion uh, many people said this, this is too hard this is far too difficult and, and made the decision to walk away. Many turned their backs and walked away from him at that point in time. And so Jesus turns to the 12 disciples and says, well, what about you? What about you? Are you going to walk away as well? And Peter comes out with that classic phrase. Peter says, Lord, to whom can we go? Where can we go? You're the one who has the words of eternal life. So Peter, recognising that, yeah, we, we, we could walk away, but what do we go back to? What do we go and do after this? Here is embodied in this person eternal life. And that's something that Jesus reiterates in that gospel reading we heard just a few moments ago, where he says this, that, that he is the way and that he is the truth and that he is the life. And he goes on to say, you know, so if we, if we follow in his ways and if we live out his truth and if we, if we embrace the life that he offers, then ultimately we will receive eternal life in him. You know the way I'm going to the place where I'm going, says Jesus. And Thomas says, well, Lord, we, we don't know where you're going, so how do we know the way? And of course, that's when he comes out with that phrase, I am the way, the truth and the life. But the promise that comes before that is that Jesus says, listen, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there are many rooms. In my father's mansion, there are many rooms. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. So if you endure by walking in the way, by living out the truth and embracing the life that he offers, then we have that place prepared for us in heaven that's our eternal destination. That's what hopefully will keep us inspired 
to journey, to face the challenges, to face the difficulties, to, to face and go through the struggles and the sufferings that we may have in life, knowing where we will ultimately be. So we've had a little wander down the yellow brick road. We've had a little journey on the yellow brick road of discipleship. But the key thing for us now is that A, first of all, we begin that journey and B, that we determine to continue in that journey and to finish the journey as well. My emotions are up and down When your love is never down Oh Lord, I'm so glad you are here Your love had you die for me Then you came Separate